In this video, I talk all things Ithaca with Blair Witch Project and Supernatural director Eduardo Sanchez and lovely Molly screenwriter Jamie Nash. We also have a very special announcement at the very end of the video, so let's do this. Let's talk Ithaca. The other night, I had a great conversation with Eduardo Sanchez, who now serves as our executive producer. We were also joined by the very talented screenwriter, Jamie Nash. We covered a lot of fun topics, from the origins and the mythologies that influenced Ithaca, to being husbands and fathers that work in the horror genre, to some of the plans that we have for Ithaca season two. We also took your video questions. They were a ton of fun to answer, and they took us to some fun places in the conversation. This video is full of spoilers, so if you have not started Ithaca season one, then... Yeah. Stop this video! Watch chapters 1 through 4 in the playlist section of this YouTube channel. Join the online sensation and shout out where you're watching from in the comments section. We'll be waiting right here for you. You've been warned. You know, I, we've known you, we knew you for a while, and then we got to work with you on VHS 2, and that's kind of where we, we really got to know the person that is the brains, the the face of Ithaca. Yeah, Jay. the ta yeah, the the, the, the talent, the talent, the talent. Yes. I mean, it's so exciting. Like I checked it out. I was I was blown away. It was amazing. I didn't even know you were really doing this over the last few years. I think I saw a teaser a couple years ago, which yeah. leads me to my first kind of question for you, if you don't mind me asking. Like, what's the timeline of this thing? Like, how long? What, what was the beginning point, and then how did it get to here? And, in a high level, you know, view? Over several years. I want to say it was about six to seven years. Um, okay. I think the first, um, well, one, Devin and I, we we adore just zombie films, you know? Uh, you know, it was one of those things that she wasn't super into until I showed her The Walking Dead and said, no, 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 no you got to stick through this. You know, there's, they've got to, it's, it's more dramatic. It's more involved. It's more of like a character piece. Well, probably after you saw VHS 2, you were really warmed up to the zombie films. <laughs> right. Yeah, that probably, yeah, that probably jump-started everything, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Talking about zombie films is everyone just, it immediately, immediately throws you into the, the first question that you came across in Night of the Living Dead. Do you go up the roof, the upper floors, or do you go down to the, the basement? Everyone immediately goes into this mode of like, okay, let me put on like this survival hat on and let me kind of analyze what this whole pandemic is gonna do. And, you know, I've got my whole strategy. That genre just immediately throws you into, what am I gonna do with myself? And then what am I gonna do with my loved ones? And everyone immediately goes like, yeah, okay, you get bitten, I'm sorry, I'm aiming for the head. You know, I'm aiming for the head and I'm bolting. And, you know, the thing about Devin is, you know, she doesn't have a callous, callous bone in her body at all. And when she and I were talking about that, we were having that conversation, okay, like, what's going to happen when you get bitten? Pulled her straight up. I was like, yeah, baby, you know, I'm, I'm doing the logical thing. I'm, I'm, sh I'm shooting you in the head <laughs> and I, I got to go. And then with Devin, you know, she just answered it, you know, so completely honestly. We're just like, Jay, I, I cannot, I cannot go through life um, without you. I would let you bite me so that I could turn. And it was just one of those things where I was like, baby, are you serious? This, that's, that's the answer that you're going with? And she's like, yeah, absolutely. This sounds like the weirdest pre-wedding retreat of all time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's true. Like, you know, everyone has that conversation of like, what are you going to do? And, uh, you know, with Devin just being, you know, just who she is, just answered it that way. And I, I just wanted to say like, okay, well, all right, maybe I'm just, you know, the logical side of my brain is going one way, but let's see how far we can take this. As I'm transforming more and more as a husband, as a father, how, how do my priorities shift? So it actually started out as what was gonna be, in my mind, a three minute short. Okay. Just a, Small, small bit, and then. And, and, and what? what and, but and what was that? What was that three minutes short? Gonna yeah. Be? I want to see what happens if there is a guy who's just in the snow, and his mm -hmm. legs have just been demolished, and he's slowly crawling away, and he's got this long stream of blood that's falling right behind him, and you see a zombie that's crawling right behind him, just 
following this trail. Okay, well, what would happen if that was his wife? And then when I asked myself that, I said, okay, well, hey, I can turn this into a 10 minute short. And then a 10 minute short turned into, hey, well, let's make this a 40 minute bit. And then it just got to the point where I liked the idea of being able to do it as this, this short little mini series because I, I, the inspiration was taken from so many different places, so many different genres. And I like the idea of being able to mix genres throughout a mini series or being able to take different flavors or say, hey, you know, for this tone, let's go for something that feels more like a, like a Western or more like a Kurosawa where you're able to just like really use environment. So this whole process was learning every single step of putting a film together, how to direct, how to write a story, how to edit, every single spot has been a learning process and with covid you know that actually just kind of made things a little more easier for us because doing screenings in person are you know much more challenging and i wanted to be able to put this in front of as many people as possible and have something that didn't have such a language barrier on it something that would really tap into your kind of like um, you know something that was relatable but also very specific to my journey as, as a husband and uh, as, as a father too. Hey guys, I'm Rihanna Nicole from Sinister Parlor Podcast. And my question is actually for Jay and Eduardo. So I'll start with Jay. Um, what made you decide to contact Eduardo with the idea of Ithaca? And Eduardo, what made you decide to become a part of Ithaca? One, uh, I had worked with, with Ed and Jamie before, several years before with VHS2. You know, Ed has such a big heart for, you know, for people who are just putting in the work, um, people in the area who are putting in the work. And, uh, you know, I just knew that I had to, to send, this, send this over to him. Ed's been so busy that it was just constantly just like every single day, just like, okay, let me send Ed, you know, chapter one, let me send it over again and let me send it over again until there was just like an opening. And, you know, finally he was able to, to check it out and we were able to talk about it. To me, it was, you know, I'm just a, I'm just a slacker pretty much. So, you know, uh, he said, yeah, Jay sent me the video a couple of different times, chapter one, uh, and it was a while. And also, I mean, look, honestly, like some, when people send me stuff, you know, especially friends that, people that I really like, um, you know, if there's a certain hesitation because I'm like, I really want this to be good. So I was like, I mean, I knew you were a talented actor, but I was like, all right, you know, let's see what he can do. So, but as soon as it came on, um, you know, I knew there was something special. Like it, you know, kept me engaged. And then when I, I didn't know anything about it. And then when I realized that it was, you know, it was kind of going into the zombie thing, I was like, all right, let's see where he's gonna go, you know, because, um, you know, the zombie genre has been, you know, pretty oversaturated lately, you know, and I was like, okay, let's see where, you know, I was like, okay, you know, a zombie thing, you know, it's going to be tough to make something original, but um, just the, you know, everything, the music, the editing, the style, the, you know, the camera work, um, and obviously your guys' performances, um, you know, it was like, I, I immediately got it. I'm like, okay, this is not about cool ass people you know cool ass you know and you know heads being exploded or you know you know zombie chases or whatever this is about what a personal thing of like all right having to you know kill your you know what are you going to do with your when your wife turns into a zombie like what the hell are you going to do and 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 i you know I, I love that internal kind of camera that you had that internal view on the character um, so, you know, that, that was, you, you had, you sent me like the, just one chapter at a time cause you were still editing, but I was like, I mean, I don't know. I can't remember exactly, but I know I, I reached out. I'm like, dude, this is amazing. Where, where's it going? You know, let's try to figure something out. You know, let's, let's try to get it out there. Okay, you know, and what's, what's your plan for it? You know, cause, and also I don't want to like get involved unless, you know, there's a place for me and, you know, and, I, and the last thing I want to do is like push you in a direction that you don't want to go in. And this is your film. This is your project. Um, but, you know, I loved it. And I was so happy that I was that I was, you know, was going to be able to say, yeah, dude, I love it and actually be, you know, honest with it, you know. Um, so, you know, th that's kind of how I came on it. And, and now I'm like, you know, really dedicated to see, try to, you know, get this one out there the first season and then see about what happens in the second season, see if we can actually 
you know, either sell it somewhere or maybe, you know, try to raise some money independently. But I, because I think, you know, I really do believe in your vision. So I, I can't wait to see what else, what season two and season three have in store for us, you know? Yeah. And, you know, to be honest, like you are the one who like really got me thinking more and more in depth when it came to, to, to season two. Um, that, you know, when you're just like, hey, what's going to happen next? You know, I had a brief idea of what I wanted to do, but then, you know, I started just hammering it out and just more and more. And that just because, you know, the idea of going into season two was just like, hey, the creative juices are going again and just going a completely different direction. It was just so much fun to just be able to share that with that second season, you know, what I do with yeah, that second I, season. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, and hopefully we'll have, you know, we'll have more resources for the second season so we can play a little bit, you know, play around a little bit. Like chapter one, when did you shoot that as opposed to like and then chapter four when did that finally end because there's some shots of like i think your your baby like with li really little feet and then later on we see the you know you know two or three years old right so yeah so i was like damn that, they took a long time to shoot it. <laughs> right yeah. so this just to check this out so for that first chapter Jaden wasn't even born yet right he wasn't even a thought so when we shot chapter one and I'm rifling through the bag and I pull out this this bloody baby's shirt, you know, I, I wanted to have that baby in the story, but you know, we hadn't even talked about having having Jaden. Um and then the fourth chapter, I think probably completed maybe about like two years ago. You know, and it taken it took about you know, three, four years to really time what uh, the snow patterns in our area for when it was going to snow, how much it was going to snow. Um, I mean, you would think that you would prepare for something that's happening, you know, that winter was going to happen in December or January, but, you know, Maryland is such a bizarre thing. Yeah, especially um, lately. Exactly, you know, and it turned out like the biggest snows would happen around March 15th, March 13th, 14th, and 15th. And it took me, you know, a couple years to be able to like really nail that date. Kind of like the boyhood of zombie movies, is what I'm saying. <laughs> did you write the chapters in the beginning or were you writing year to year? You know, did you, or were you just rewriting year to year? There was a lot of rewriting from year to year. Um, and actually what I ended up following most was, uh, I, I really like Robert McKee's version of way of structuring stories. I like the way that he talks about, you know, constantly putting your unconscious desire versus your conscious desire and having those battle each other. As the story was going on, um, I noticed those values were, were, were shifting quite a bit for me. Mm -hmm. um, and as I was maturing more and more as a filmmaker and as a storyteller, it was just kind of chopping off the fat, just saying like, look, this part of the story is not necessary. Let's just try to streamline this as much as possible. So so how much footage did you end up with, you know, for every, you know, uh, uh, and, and did you, I, I guess what you were doing is, did you edit the first chapter, and, you know, shot the first chapter or whatever, and then edit that, and then a year later you shot the second chapter? Like, how was that? And, and, and you know, like, and how much footage did you end up having, like, you know, raw footage um raw footage uh i i don't know just hours upon hours upon hours you know to be honest we were still filming things for chapter four up until i, I want to say just just may you know there are times where it's just like okay well there's just one bit of the story that still needs to to hit there's this one emotional beat that's that's just not clicking how long is the whole thing end to end season one i think is about 27 minutes Hey bro, bro, greetings from Panama. I watched the series, I loved it. I found about it on one social media. And of course, this is a Q&A, so I wanted to ask you, uh, in the first season, we saw more of a psychological terror. Uh, one of the most scary scenes for me is the the short scene. And of course, it was or was not real. I, I, I didn't catch it. But of course, I want to know if in the next season, are we gonna see more of this type of terror, or are we gonna see more of a monster terror from, especially from the zombie-like creatures and the girl, uh, the the woman who name I cannot pronounce correctly, but of course I, I wanna know what's for the future. F future. 
Um, right. For the next season, yeah, you know, I, I love the, the, the psychological horror. Uh, you know, I love being able to film that. I love being able to find different ways for the audience to be creeped out by just the way you move a camera, the transitions. I think um, I, I just, I, I love being able to tell the story with how a camera moves and discovering the visceral ways to be able to affect an audience. You know, one of my favorite movies to just display this was called Clean Shaven. And essentially it was just trying to depict, you know, what it feels like for someone who has paranoid schizophrenia. And they would find just all sorts of camera angles, transitions, sounds to just make the audience just feel like, wait, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing sirens right behind me and I'm driving. I know I hear these sirens. That is just brilliant, fun filmmaking because, you know, you're creating this visceral response in an audience and I wanted to explore that more. You sent it to me early before, you know, you released it. And, um, I, you know, just like Jamie, I was super impressed by it. Um, and what I thought was, you know, was great about it was that, you know, you the, the, the you took the, it's like, a, you know, it's a zombie. It has kind of the basic foundation of, you know, of zombies, of, fa you know, fast running zombies. So not George Romero zombies, it's the quick zombies. Um, but then there's like this. You know, there's this super psychological, um, you know, semi-supernatural, like you don't know if it's supernatural or not, or if the guy's just like going through, you know, you know, he's just going through PTSD. I mean, I don't know, you know, that to me was like what, you know, you know, I don't think you could get, get do just a normal zombie show like this. I think that's what really elevated it. Um, and, you know, t tell us a little bit about that, like how you ended up like, you know, I know you, you the original thing was to stay in, in the, in the you know, the main guy's head. Um, but what, you know, how did you come up with all that other stuff? And maybe, and I know, I know some of it because we've talked about it, but tell us a little bit more about like the kind of the, the mythology behind it, you know? You know, you talk about like fast zombies and slow zombies. I love both of them for different reasons. Yeah, yeah. For for any like Romero type zombies, the thing that I, I have dreams about that kind of zombie. And the reason is I love the slow impending doom that's coming at you. That I really love that because it gives you like time to think. And, you know, depending on how well you've you know, how well you're doing with the battlefield inside your mind, what plays out is is really exciting. So that's what I wanted to accomplish with mainly with Devin's character, especially once you start seeing her towards the end, having that slow crawling, something that is can be a manifestation of, a physical manifestation of my character's guilt, you know, but can also be something that uh, his point of view of what she is can change throughout you know fast zombies like one they're just I, I, you know, I mean they're they're super super creepy as well i like the idea that it just kind of changes up the game um but i didn't want to make a, a series that was so focused on the idea of trying to hide and run from just fast zombies um the supernatural part with with the character rangda um, I mean, I grew up in Indonesia, I grew up there in Indonesia for, um, I want to say about 15 years before I came to the States. And um, our family fled the country because there was a huge, huge riot in 1998 where you know, I think it was about like 1,700 people died in one day. One of the things that my school did is, you know, they tried to ingrain the culture. Uh, in us as much as possible, expose it to us as much as possible. And with Bali, you know, the Balinese mythology, one of the first things that I ever saw was this performance called the Barong. Um, it's become more of a touristy thing now, but it was a performance that depicted the eternal battle between good and evil. It was attached to this story that happened in, uh, I want to say like the 11th century. This Javanese princess, she got married to this uh, this uh, Balinese king, but she ended up being banished from the kingdom because she was practicing black magic. So according to the story, according to like the mythology, she ended up, you know, bringing up this army of, uh, of, of witches, of demonic spirits to help her kind of take over and uh, just ruin the entire kingdom. And when she and her, uh, her army came across any of the soldiers, they would put the spell on them that would make them take their knives out and uh, try to commit suicide. 
in the performance, when you're watching it on stage, you're seeing these men gathered around trying to fight this horrific, terrifying looking witch. She's just supposed to be the representation of everything evil. Just these long nails, this white pale face with these bulging eyes, this long tongue and fangs. And she would put the spell on these guys and they would just writhe around with their daggers against their chests and trying to commit suicide. And it was, when this performance would be done, these guys would, would go into trance. They said that they would go into possession doing this performance. But there would be this good spirit called the Barong that would come and put this spell on their chest to make their chest impenetrable. So you're watching 20 of these guys writhing around the floors, just violently shaking and shouting, but these knives just couldn't break the skin. Some of them, you know, were actually bending on the chests, you know, and actually curving. They, they still believe in, in trance. There's still performances where you see these, you know, men and women going into trance, going into possession. It's a god, it's a goddess, it's a spirit that's making itself known, physically known. When you hear Rangda speaking in the, uh, um, in the uh, stairwell scene, um, to make sure that I was doing that correctly, um, I searched high and low to have to find someone who could actually translate um, 11th century ancient Kawi, and instead of just the you know just instead of Bahasa Indonesia, which is just the language that you speak. And I was like, okay, well, no. If I want to be as accurate as possible, I have to find and do a recording of myself doing the the ancient Javanese Kawi found a guy who managed to do it just somewhere in Bali and you can hear him recording it in in uh just in his village you could hear the chickens in the background the roosters and it was this haunting haunting you know melodic tone <laughs> You know, one of the things that I love about it is you know, when it comes to the mythology, I mean, it's inspired by the Kalanarang, the, 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 the Odyssey, the journey of Odysseus, Arthurian legend. I like the fact that there is so much that just really combine all of those stories together, you know, in terms of just, just that eternal struggle, being chiseled by the horrendous things in your life to help you find your moral compass. It was awesome, man. I, I think, and, 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 um, like you know does does that soup does the mythology have because you know that's what everybody asked you know in a zombie movie like eventually it, your zombie shows that eventually everybody's like okay well, how did this happen you know every everything has a different you know it's like a you know you know some a space spore came and yeah so to like in your you know i know you don't really re you don't reveal it in the you know in the first season but like to it, what happened like is it is it something supernatural is happening in this area is it is it worldwide or is it just in this you know in in the area where the characters live like give us what what, what do you think yeah so so interestingly enough it's not as important to me to make the specifics of what caused the zombie apocalypse so it could be it could be anything it's just basic yeah i mean i think it's one of those things where it's just i like the fact that look it could be you know I, I i like the fact that it could be like hey you know something came from space hey it could be this you know new version of of the nile flu or or whatever you know yeah. i like that but what's more important is with all of these different origin origin stories of the zombie apocalypse i like that they can almost all be true just because that there is just this confusion of information that's being, you know, transferred from one country to the next country, this kind of paranoia that can go on in terms of like, okay, well, what information is, is right, what information is true, but what's most important is this guy's journey and how it's affecting him. 
you know, and affecting what's important to him. This is a story, you know, about this connection with this husband and wife, and there's something that's broken here. And what's important to him has been has been damaged. And we don't know if it's because of him or if it's because of his wife, but we can see that this guy is carrying a shit ton of resentment and a shit ton of guilt. How are those playing out? But then you get surprised with this whole new supernatural thing that's going on in there. It's more like the zombie apocalypse stuff that's happening is kind of thrusting him into the arms of this supernatural thing that has its whole new consequences. Yeah, and the and that the genre is like so, you know, there's been so much stuff that you don't really even need to explain it. It's just like, okay, there's some kind of zombie apocalypse and this is now we just let's jump into the story. You know, luckily, knock on wood, like if we get to do season two and three and four, I think you can start laying in because, you know, you have more time. It's just like, you know, like like Walking Dead, you know, they, they, they've, you know, in the first season, they gave you an, a kind of an explanation of what happened, but they don't, they never mention it again because it has nothing to do with their world. Who, you know, yeah. who cares what happened? We have to figure out what the hell, you know, how to survive. You're in there now. You're just in the shit now. Yeah. yeah but, it, but it would be cool to kind of go back and, you know, figure out, you know, something, you know, just give like clues, you yeah. know, it, it, hopefully we get a, you know, we, we can get it, we can explore that, you know? Yeah, Absolutely. Um, and you know, there's a you know, with something that does have a lot of different flashbacks in there, and I like the idea of being able to kind of play around with um, multiple timelines, I guess you can say, and finding how all those timelines can can interweave. You know, that's kind of the ins you know where I took the inspiration from the Odyssey. You know, you with the Odyssey, it starts in the middle of the story. Odysseus is already, you know, he's already been shipwrecked at this place and he's dealing with, I wanna say the Phaeacians. And, you know, they can sort of call it in, in media race, you're, you're in the middle. And then he starts telling the story and it goes all the way back. And then you see how he gets up to this point and then continues from there. So with Ithaca, it is this journey back home. You're finding out, okay, well, what's this return point you know a lot of stories go from like a a b to c i wanted to see what happens we start kind of going backwards and having to rectify things by going back into your past revisiting old old places that you've been to try to rectify things that you have to move backwards in order to move forward i, I, I there was just something about that idea with that was very intriguing to me you know do you see season two or you know do you, do, you, do you keep the little six, seven minute chunks? Uh, I mean, you know, obviously it depends on where you end up, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, because, you know, you could, all, I could almost see this as like, and, I, and I, some shows do this is the idea of like having, you know, if it's a half hour show, you do three little segments that could be, you know, they're little acts, but, you know, but they could be complete different time periods. Like, I think people, you know, I think the thing about streaming is that, you know, like I'm watching Mindhunter right now. And it's such a slow show. Like it has like, you know, people, they get out of the car and they put their jackets on and they walk, like that's like 70s stuff. <laughs> yeah. and, and then, you know, you have that and then you can have, you know, Michael Bay's movie, you know, on Netflix that is like, there's like a thousand cuts in the first 10 minutes or something. So, you know, I love the idea that, that you know, I think streaming has made people more patient and, and the audience like more accepting more things and i really do think that it could work as like little seven minute clips in a one and a half hour show you know because i because it really does feel you know it feels right the way the length is you know it just feels so perfect for this yeah you know what what i've seen for me is just that there's so much unexplored territory if i had to make it into 20 minutes i could if I had to do it into 30 minutes, I'm sure there is. It's just the journey of being able to do that and find what it is, that's so much fun for me. I've been wanting to, you know, ever since I saw it, I watched it again today. Um, tell me, a, you know, tell us a little bit about the, the technical side of it. Like, you know, did you have the same, I, I didn't notice, I didn't look, do you have the same DP the whole time? What's the size of the crew? I'm sure it varied and then, the snow scene, like I, I know you talked a little bit about that, but like, basically, you, you know, you had Christopher, you guys have on, you, you knew the scene, and you had already cast, and you were like, all right, as soon as it snows, we're ready to go, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, tell us a little bit about that too. Christopher's a good guy to have on call for that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> Great. He'll, he'll, he'll show up. Yeah. Yeah, that guy's all heart, and that's the thing I love about it, you know. 
So with, uh, with chapter one, it was just me, Devin, and uh, Doug Henderson and Matt Neese of Everything's Fire. So just the four of us, um, you know, and then for a lot of the flashback stuff, it's I'm, I'm holding the camera for it. There are several times where, you know, I'm shooting a scene with Devin, we're acting together and I'm holding the camera at the exact okay. same time. Yeah. You know, that's how, <laughs> you know, that's how technical we got with it, you know, so high tech. Um, we had the same DP um, throughout, you know, Matt Neese and Doug Henderson were phenomenal throughout and they were incredibly patient with me as I learned to just figure out how to tell the story just deeper and chisel it and they, you know, they said, yeah, we'll keep coming back to it because they just love my dedication to this project and they love, you know, they just had faith in my abilities to be able to, to pull this off because I spent several, several months just constantly just storyboarding every single shot as best as I could. And then I would film these small little segments, you know, just outside of the backyard, just to try to see if that would work, see if the camera movement was correct. You know, if that would, you know, for, for me, I, I, every second was just a little piece of art where I could just drop information in there. I would give that over to, to Doug and Matt and say, okay, well, what do you think? You know, is this something that we can work around? How do we elevate this? By the time we got to chapter two, we, you know, it was just, once again, just me, Devin, Matt, Doug, and we had one more person who was on crew with us, you know, to, to play a dead body, to help us put some blood around. Yeah. Chapter three, we had, I want to say maybe four more people who were willing to just kind of help set, decorate, as well as be extras and zombies and run in there. And then chapter four, I want to say it was about, you know, four or five of us once again. So it, I don't think we ever had anything more than five to six people. You know, speaking of that, the cinematography is really what popped for me. Just the, and not only the cinematography, but the staging, you know, how you're moving in and out of the uh, frame. And I, I saw that you did this video storyboards, which I'm guessing that was probably a way, here, here's my real question. Here's my question. How much coverage did you do versus how much did you just interpret those video storyboards? Because the shot seems so, it seems like you got so much different coverage. Like we'll be, we'll be on your face and then we'll be behind you from like 30 feet away in a wide and then we'll be behind a tree in a stocky POV. It's the type of thing that television shows and movies take a long time to do, but on independent film sets, you usually can't get all that stuff and get all the close-ups and all the other stuff you need. Um, so how, how much, like, were those interpreted exactly? How much wiggle room did you kind of have on the set? Uh, not too much. I tried to figure out in my head, um, for the snow scene in particular, that was one where I figured, okay, well, there are certain scenes where we need to just have longer takes to be able to have more information in there and, you know, really have the camera be able to wrap around and just capture different elements at the perfect time. So I was very specific in my head in terms of what beats I wanted those to be. I was very, very precise with what we wanted, especially when it got to the fact that we lost our location right before we had to shoot and we have three hours to shoot before yeah. we plus, it, plus, it, it looked, plus it looked like it was freezing. Yeah, it, it was. Uh, but you yeah. know, to be honest, I, you know, I, I felt more for, um, for, for Chris Inlow, just having to sit there just in wet blood yeah. Um, for me, like I was moving the entire time, so I, I had no idea that I had icicles just forming in my hair. But when you're in, in that kind of pressure of, okay, I need to try to keep people warm, I need to be able to do this as fast as possible. With that fourth chapter, I think we only had maybe two to three takes on each shot to try to nail it. Yeah. And then we just had to move on. Gentlemen. Craig here from the T3 Podcast Network. Now, we cannot stop thinking, discussing, talking about Ithaca amongst ourselves, but somehow we were able to narrow it down to three questions we wanted to ask you guys. Now, question number one. If you look at the YouTube page for T3 Podcast Network, and then you look at the beauty and majesty that is Ithaca, it's basically like comparing my seven-year-old's unboxing videos that she films for no one to Citizen Kane. So, what sort of editing software did you guys use to actually create Ithaca? because we want to buy it and try and look semi-professional ourselves or as much as we can be. Uh, question number two, 
All right, filming this together with your wife, Jay, is amazing. And we love the fact that you do that. We even love that there's a little special appearances from your lovely daughter in there. All right, but what sort of stress did putting this movie together put on your family? This guerrilla style filmmaking, this doing it all yourself filmmaking isn't easy. And I know you know about that too, Eduardo. So what sort of stress does this put on your family with this dedication, with all of this love and attention you're putting into it? Is that hard on your family? I mean, it seems like your family vacations were now taking up filming various scenes and site locating. So, you know, talk about that. And then question three, our final question. Is there anything about your films, either of you, that you've made that still sticks with you, that still attaches to you, that still gives you those willies? Because sleeping in church pews, yeah, that's we're still feeling that, all right? We still got attention from that. Um, sorry. Anybody standing in the corner of a room? Yeah, thanks, Eduardo. Uh, that's never going to be the same again. And now that I've watched Lovely Molly, I'm probably just not going to sleep anymore. So, you know, thanks for that, too. Uh, but is there any part of your films that you feel still stick with you that still give you those little heebie-jeebies like they do us? Or are we just a bunch of girls? Uh, please let us know these questions and thank you again for making Ithaca because it was amazing. And we cannot wait for the next part to come out. So when it came to the uh, editing software, I actually, you know, with this, I tried to use as many free and available resources as possible, just to one, to just show how much you can do without having a lot of resources. Hit Film Express, it's completely free, but what you're able to do with that editing software is phenomenal. How did you learn? Did you, had you edited before or was this, were you just learning as you went? So I was actually I was learning as I was going along, but you know, first I learned on iMovie. <laughs> you know, just I'd never, you know, I'd seen what the basic workflow and layout was for people working on like Final Cut, and it was so just um, uh, intimidating. Yeah, it's you know, just it, it really is. And you know, with iMovie, it was just understanding. Okay, let me just take this clip, shorten it down, and then put it over here. And then when it came to the music, it was the same thing. You know, I, I used GarageBand. I just tried to figure out every single sound, every single dial, tried to work it in every single way possible. And for some of the audio, I just recorded the audio from, from an iPhone. I found that like, wow, I can actually get incredible ADR just with what you have in your hand. Yeah. You know, equipment is so accessible now i think that's great i think that's great for filmmakers that you know everyone has that opportunity to be able to just look through a lens and see what kind of story that they want to tell what about the stress you know the second part the stress on the family and you know like tell me a little bit about that yeah that was miserable <laughs> yeah the the stress on the family was uh it's no joke it was it was um i mean Devin and i we definitely you know been all up and down there were times when you know we weren't sure if we were going to have to to recast it you know with with Devin you know when you know when we found out that that we were pregnant and we were doing scenes where you know she's trying to move around with her you know with seven months in the womb and we're just like I, I don't know how we're going to do things but it turned out to be the most wonderful thing to, to add to the story you know the fact that we have we actually captured a scene of Devin and I holding her belly and actually responding to, to Jaden kicking inside her womb. Like the fact that we have to, we get to have that on film. I mean, it's it's a whole new level of, of home video for us. You know, we have moments where Jaden is able to see the ocean for the very first time. Like I got to capture that and that's in the film. I love that, I love that, I love that my legacy, you know, my, my daughter, my, my wife, that really just gets to be tied into this, this, you know, into this story, this epic that we're doing, but it's, it was not easy at all, you know, I, I've made a lot of mistakes, it, you know, Devin has been amazing in terms of just, like, showing me grace, showing me for forgiveness, teaching me how to forgive, really guiding me towards, you know, letting go of resentments or bitterness and just helping me on this, this journey of, you know, becoming um, a better husband, a be uh, becoming a better father. Um, not easy at all, dude, but it's, 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 I, I, I'm a proponent of pursuing what's meaningful as opposed to pursuing what's expedient. And this was just 
meaningful growth. That's great, man. Yeah, how about you? Like, you know, like what was it for, for you and your family? Um, I mean, you know, the, the, when we, when I started out, um, I wasn't married yet. And when we did Blair Witch, I mean, you know, you basically, from the time I was 16 years old until we did Blair Witch, I did, you know, I just ate and drank and, you know, breathed film, um, you know, just trying to make it. And, you know, Blair Witch was not my first feature. I did two features before Blair Witch. Um, so, you know, the disappointment and just like the, you know, just the, like, again, like just trying to figure out, okay, how much am I going to devote to filmmaking and how much am I going to devote to my life, you know? And I got, you know, we got lucky, um, you know, we happened to hit with Blair Witch and then really the family time became, you know, happened. I don't know what, if I was, if I was married and still, you know, not, you know, a, 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 an established filmmaker. I'm not sure. Like, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I, I really look up to you for that reason, because I don't know where, you know, if I would have had that, you know, that motivation, you know, um, but it is, it, you know, it's special for you guys because Devin's a great actress and, you know, you guys are, had this team. And then of course, you know, your kid, you know, he's going to, he's got, she's got to work for free for you. <laughs> and, you know, you've got, you got free talent there. So you've got to take advantage of that. Um, but, uh, but you know, it, yeah, it must have been, I can imagine it's stressful, but also really special to make a film with your family, you know, with your families, like the core, of, you know, the core actors in the, in the film. Yeah. You know, it's, it's been an interesting journey for Jaden because um, her trying to understand these horrific, scary things, scary images, um, and trying to be more comfortable around it, you know, when we were doing some scenes that uh, where Rango was in there, you know, she was very terrified at first of like what this creature was, but then seeing us put the makeup on Beth's arm and understanding the process and then trying to understand this world of action, cut, and yeah. what happens in between there. Daddy is different, mommy's different. Why are mommy and daddy fighting, you know, while this thing is going on? Or, you know, why is this creepy thing that's coming out? So like, I'm, I'm curious as to like your side in terms of like your kids being exposed to, to all of this, what their journey was into this, this horror world. I mean, you know, the, you know, I didn't have kids till after, you know, we were, I was a little more established. So it, I, the only time really that I can kind of compare to, you know, the only time, cause the, you know, I try to bring my kids as much, you know, especially when they were little to the films as much as I can. And yeah, you got to be careful, man, because like, like I, I still have, you know, memories of like, you know, Bianca, my, my oldest, my daughter, my oldest was, you know, pretty young when we did Altered. And, you know, we had this creepy, you know, uh, creepy alien costume. And I remember like her being really afraid and Misty Rosas, who's, who has played the creature, you know, she, I, I guess she'd done it before, so she kind of would take, you know, would leave the mask off, and, you know, the helmet, the, the, the headpiece off, and, you know, kind of play with her and, like, you know, not, try not to freak her out. But, you know, it, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, especially watching for your kid, you know, like watching your mom and your dad doing, you know, crazy things, like it must have been, it must have been quite a, 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 you know, quite an experience. But my kids, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's a, like, like, for me, like, you know, how, when do I show, when would I show them Blair Witch? You know, like, how old do they have to be? Yeah. Because, um, again, you know, you don't want to scar your kids. And, you know, I, I saw some horror movies when I was a little too young um, that, you know, still kind of, you know, definitely, you know, messed me up in a certain way. Um, so, you know, you just got to be careful. But, again, again, it's very important, like what you were talking about, is to show the, your kids that this is make believe. That is this somebody in a costume. That it, there is, you know, like you were saying, between action and cut, that's that's fake. And then and then everybody becomes normal. And every, you know, daddy comes back, and you know, he's not he's not that character anymore. Like that's you know pretty important, especially if that's going to be part of their lives. But Ben, before we move on, man, tell me about that demon. Tell me about like give me the the because that's this one I really was like looking for kind of little details and I was like wow they did you know a low budget demon is very difficult to do and you guys pulled it off like crazy like you know just with the photography and the angles and just like the little bits the editing 
tell me about like who was it? I tell me about Beth and how that process, yeah. you know, creating that creature. So we actually had three different people playing that character at different times. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Doug Henderson, who is you know part of Everything's Fire, and um, uh, Beth Wirt. She played you know. Rangda's arm in the fourth chapter, and then Marissa Shafi, she played uh, Rangda for the third chapter. And actually what we did for the third chapter, that was one where you get to see a lot of the um, uh, the fire sequences. Yeah. Um, that was actually a lot of fun to do, because you know I have the, the Balinese mask of Rangda. Um, it's this incredibly just haunting mask. When we were filming that fire sequence, we covered Beth uh, sorry, we covered Marissa just in, in wet clay and it just caked around her and we had this huge bonfire behind her. And if I recall, I actually shot in um, a much slower frame rate um, and would just use a flashlight to just briefly shine it on Rangda and take it away, Fla flash it on her again. And it created this nice strobe effect as I was, you know, speeding the, you know, speeding it up. With Beth, I think we just covered her arm in black paint and then just threw on some white latex on there, and it created this beautiful texture. Um, and then we just made these these long fingernails, which is what that character is known for, just having these long, long fingernails. Um, but yeah, just her whole character is something that just has intrigued me and haunted me since I was a kid. Sweet, man. I loved it, man. I thought it was, uh, I mean, you know, especially for no budget, it was, you know, it, it, it was very tasteful and, and creepy as shit, you know? So. Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, I mean, with a little bunch of stuff, like, the, the less you show, I mean, it's it always lends itself for the audience to be able to just let their imagination go with the character. So then, real quick, the, the so you guys were basically looking at whether you have everything set up, and you're looking at the at the weather patterns, and then what do you call each other and be like, all right, it looks like Saturday or it looks like Friday night is gonna, you know, like how do you? And then once you start, it starts snowing. You're like, all right, let's go. We got you know four hours to shoot this. Like, how, tell me about that. And then you lost the location. Like, yeah. tell us a little bit about that day. Man, yeah. So we had actually met. I want to say in like December of whatever year that was, two, three years ago, and. Uh, you know, I had spent several months before that just doing those like pre-visual shots, you know, those test shots and saying, okay, this is exactly how I want to shoot. This is exactly what we need because we can't waste any time on this. I thought we were gonna shoot it in like January. I thought that was like the height of winter and it just stopped snowing after that. There was no snow and it started getting warmer. And I said, okay, well, I, I guess we just have to wait until next year. I ended up taking another gig around March 15th, and then out of nowhere, March 15th, just snow, six, seven inches of snow. And I was just so frustrated with myself, just like, oh gosh, I really need to be on top of this. So I spent that entire year just making sure that like I was very precise, knew what I wanted, knew what equipment we needed, knew what we needed to try to keep people warm. Um, met with Doug and Matt, uh, showed them the video, picked out, okay, this is the, this is exactly where I need these trees to be. It was this nice park and got in touch with all the actors, you know, beforehand and just said, listen, in this next week, as March 15th is coming up, this has happened every single year for the past four years, we are going to have, you know, we're going to have a big snowstorm. I don't care how hot it says that it's going to be right now. We're going to have this on like these three days. So just be mindful of that. And uh, they kept their schedules open. And then sure enough, that day came and we all met up at the offices of Everything's Fire and just crashed there for the night. Um, got up in the morning, we did some more rehearsals and then Doug spoke to me and said, we don't have the location anymore. You know, this was, we were getting ready to just go out to that location and have an entire day being able to shoot in the snow, take our time. And he said, yeah, we don't have it. And uh, the woman who is, you know, the, the, I guess the Parks and Recs lady there, she just said, look, you're, we don't want a zombie film being filmed on this location. We don't want something with violence being shot here. We don't want anything that has blood that, there. And uh, so I sent her, you know, the chapter, the first chapter, just trying to say like, listen, look, we're, we're, we're hope you understand that we're trying to go for something different. I don't want to sound pretentious. It's not 
a zombie film. It's just, it's, it's yeah. different, yeah, you know? But it was no go. And, you know, time was passing and the snow was building up more and more on the roads. And, you know, Doug was scrambling around trying to find anyone who had, you know, a backyard that just had trees all around it where we wouldn't get any, uh, any footage of uh, someone's house in the background or cars. And I, I want to say it was past the afternoon and it looked like we weren't, we were just going to have to cancel again. And if somehow he managed to find someone who said, yeah, we have this, you can definitely film in our, in our backyard. Um, problem is it's like 45 minutes away and it's already been snowing for several hours. So this, the roads are going to be slick as hell and it's still coming down hard. And we got to get all these people, you know, into these cars and try to get them over there. And I swear there were, there were points where we had to push the car up the hill, you know, it's getting darker and darker and darker. Um, but we managed to, to film in just the few hours that we had to try to get it done. And then once we got that last shot, it was like, okay, now we got to get everyone back home safely. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, cause, cause as I was, as I was watching, especially this time, I was like, you know, because you're, it's snowing, you're like, oh, that's great. But then, I'll, you know, if you're not done and it stops snowing, you're like, oh, God, you know, because, yeah. you know, the, you're not going to match. So I'm sure you were stressed out like crazy. I can't, Im I can't imagine how stressed you must have been. Yeah, because well, the hardest part is not only just making sure that all the logistics are there, you know, not just knowing what you're, you're going to shoot. It's knowing what you're going to shoot and then immediately having to jump in front of the camera and yeah. act you know, and say, okay, am I making things clear with how I'm responding? Does the audience, you know, know what's going on, you know, as they're watching all the subtleties and nuances that are happening in my face and in how I'm looking? And that was just, uh, you know, it that, that was probably the hardest day, being able to have to wear those two hats at the same time with such a time crunch. Yeah, that's crazy. Have, have you considered, uh, will there ever come a time where we'll play festivals if if the uh, world opens up again? Is yeah, that something you, know, you consider? I, I, yeah, I've submitted to some of the bigger ones. I'm not, I'm like, I'm, to be honest, I'm not really big on the, the festival thing, mm -hmm. but um, it, it's difficult, you know, it's very difficult in the, in the indie film world where some things don't seem to have credibility unless you see wreaths around it. And, I don't know, for me, I'm a little more cynical about that. I, I Sometimes I just feel like, you know, I'm kind of like paying for a wreath and there's so many festivals that yeah. can be very obscure, you know? Yeah I, I'm, yeah, I mean, the festival thing is, I mean, if you can get into any of the big ones, you know, it's kind of a no brainer, but um, other than that, I mean, unless you, you know, it's, you know, you want to, you want the audience, you know, you want to see what an audience reacts to, you know, to your stuff. But I mean, with YouTube and the way you're doing it now, I mean, you're getting reaction you know, straight reaction from the audience. So, um, you know, like I said, unless you can get into any one of the big ones, you're not really, it's not really gonna do any good, you know? What's more important for me is being able to just like really engage with people. Yeah. Um, I like the fact that, you know, heck, this is a story that, you know, I just, I created with my wife. I like the fact that a husband and wife can sit down just on the couch and just with their, their phone or their TV and say, okay, we're gonna just watch 10 minutes of this and just be, creeped out together to have people say like, wait, okay, okay, that hooked me there. Okay, can you give me another five minutes? Yeah, that hooked me there too. Okay, what's the next thing? That's just, that's what's most fun. You know, being able to collaborate with people who have the same, you know, are interested in the same kinds of human condition experiences, that's, that's, that's a blast. Yeah. And is it gonna be, I mean, you know, give us, can you give us any more? Like what, I mean, you know, is it does it is it become a bigger story eventually like what you know yeah absolutely i'm, I'm aiming for something that you know is is going to get bigger you know i i love that idea i love the adventure genre and with adventure you're having bigger set pieces you know you're you're dealing with forces that you don't understand even more um and i i love seeing those characters just getting in over their heads when it comes to um you know, that, that adventure um, and horror combined together. I think that's an awesome genre. I think they have so much in common. Well, dude, we're, uh, you know, we're all looking forward to it and hoping that uh, it happens soon, you know what I'm saying? So, sooner yeah. rather than, than later.
It would take seven years this time. Or do, yeah, if it's this yeah, awesome. Seven years, man. Come on. Get your, Come on. Yeah, I might we'll give you a six. To, I don't know. We might have to have just like another baby just to film some of the flashback <laughs> <Yeah>. stuff. <laughs> hey, guys, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this, guys. I, I really no, dude, do. I mean, it was, you know, it's... It's so worth it, man. And I, like, again, like, you know, we're progressing, you know, Greg and I and are progressing into the TV world a little, you know, more each time, you know, each day. And hopefully we'll be able to have, you know, get this, you know, help you to get this season two going and, you know, maybe with a real, you know, maybe, you know, with a streamer or somebody. And then if not, hell man let's just do you know uh indiegogo and like just try to raise a little bit of money and see you know try to get some resource together and do something you know and get it going you know want to see season two bring it to me before i get too old to watch let's break some legs here you know so thank you to renan nicole from the sinister parlor podcast jonathan ruiz from panama and craig enfield from the t3 podcast network for sending in your video questions for your update we are super thrilled to unveil our official Ithaca poster. We will be making these posters available for everyone shortly in a variety of sizes and signed by actors, the producers, and the crew. Also, we will soon be releasing which subscriber has won our Ithaca gear giveaway. The names here have been randomly selected from our first 250 subscribers. Thank you to everyone who's been supporting Ithaca by subscribing to this channel. It really helps put our project on the map and further on the road to making season two with more resources. If you want to be entered into any of our giveaways, be sure to subscribe. And once again, if you enjoyed Ithaca season one and you want to know what happens next, you want to see what happens in the next chapter, you want to see Ithaca season two, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button and share Ithaca. Until the next video, we'll see you in the arena.